I was reminded a couple weeks ago um, about a, something this missionary said when I was in Suriname. Um, he was preaching at this church, and he said the pastor told him that he didn't have a time limit. He said, even though the pastor told me I don't have a time limit, I know I have a time limit. And he said, uh, it's not the pastor who decides how long you get to preach, it's the nursery workers. <laughs> I was reminded about this because, okay, now I've done like every ministry in this church possibly has to offer. There's one that I rarely, rarely do, and that's nursery. And I was reminded why, because I helped out Amanda, because Amanda and Josh came up here and they thanked the congregation for praying for them and helping them during their time of sickness. So I was in there for just a short while. It felt like about a couple years. <laughs> but like, it was like chaos. I didn't even know what I was doing. It's like me and Amanda, me and Amanda and Josh's daughter, Cadence. And like, like one kid is like building this like little castle. And then like this other girl, she comes up and she's like, rawr, and she knocks it down like she's Godzilla. And the other kid looks at her and I'm like, I'm looking at her, and she's like, yeah, I did it. What are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to discipline little kids like that. Another kid's, like, playing queen of, the, uh, queen of the playground stuff, and another kid's trying to knock her off, so I'm like, stop doing that. Mean meanwhile, uh, um, Mike and Jess's uh, daughter, Mimi, she's making this, like, exclusive nightclub with the <laughs> Noah's boat, which, which I guess I, I, I wasn't dressed right to go in because she told me no. No, I couldn't. <laughs> All that to say... Those of you who work in nursery, thank you so very, very much. And nursing, we need nursery workers. Oh, actually, the awesome transition. We need nursery workers. If that, is, if that is your thing, that is awesome. It's not my thing, and I think you are awesome. So this passage we're going to be talking about tonight here is in Lamentations. Now... I really love preaching. I love every moment I get to preach. I love every chance I get to preach. Now, so when I say that I'm not really looking forward to preaching this message, it's not that I don't like preaching, and it's not that I don't like the passage. It's actually the exact opposite. I love this passage of Scripture. God has taught me more in this book of Lamentations about himself, about myself, about suffering, about enduring, than I can really say. It's just that it is so very personal. It is just very sacred to me. Because in the darkest moments of my life, this is what God used to pull me out. In the darkest moments of my life, this is what God used, his refining fire, to make me, to make me into more of the image of his son. So I feel, so preaching this message, I do feel very exposed and vulnerable. I don't really think I could feel more exposed or vulnerable, even if I was, gonna, even if I was to read you today the edgy Avengers fan fiction I, read, I wrote as a teenager. <laughs> Spoiler alert, Captain America's a vampire. So, getting into God's word here, and before I get into that, I just want to pray over it real quick. Father, you who love us and show us compassion, you who can, you who can take us through the fire and make us pure on the other side, you who have kept us for yourself, anoint your word today. Anoint it as it comes from my lips. Father, please speak to your people today. Give them strength. Give them boldness. Because, Father, we are yours. We are your children. We know that you love us and that you show compassion to us and that you will make us, you will make us pure gold like that refiner's fire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, this passage here, um, when I was first saved, when God first saved me, I was really hungry to know what God wanted for me. I was really hungry to know his word because um, while my family rarely went to church, when we did go to church, I just always figured, um, you know, it's the, it's the priest, it's the pastor's job to tell me God's word, and it was my job to ignore him and do whatever I wanted anyway. But when God saved me and gave me life, I was all of a sudden, it's like, what, do, what does God want from me? What, do, what is God's thoughts concerning me? So I got this, I got a Bible from my youth pastor. It was a used one. It was kind of cool because it actually had like notes to like somebody else in them. So it's like, oh, I love you today, honey. I'm like, oh, that's good to know. Um, so I would read a chapter from the Old Testament, a chapter from the New Testament, and a chapter in Revelation. That was during like the height of like the left behind craze. So like everybody was reading Revelation. And I would like to say that was like the only bit I didn't understand, but I didn't under really understand the rest. I didn't understand the context. I didn't understand the history behind it. And I remember before I was saved, um, one time going to Sunday school and they were talking about Abraham. 
um, leading the people of Israel to the promised land. And I was like, Abraham Lincoln led the people of Israel to the promised land? Are you kidding me? He frees the slaves? He's in the Bible? This guy's awesome! So I didn't know any of that. So I, but I mean, in each chapter I would read, there'd be something I, I could get, though. There'd be something um, I would understand that would be encouraging. And then I got to this little book called Lamentations, and it changed my life forever. Lamentations, what's going on here is the word, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's about lamenting, about crying. Lamentations means to, means to cry loudly. I don't know, I, I didn't know this at the time, but the author um, was a prophet called Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the last prophets before Israel was crushed by their enemies. The reason why Israel was crushed by their enemies goes all the way back to the moment when God brings them into the promised land and he dr has them drive out the nations that are there. And he tells them, don't do what they do. If I could paraphrase the words of God, there's a reason why he was driving them out. There was this, this reason, it had everything to do with their demonic religion. He says, don't intermarry, don't do what they do, or I'll do the same to you. Because while God chose the people of Israel, it didn't make them special to where they could sin, and God would never show judgment. Long story short, a very long story short, they do. They do exactly the opposite of what God told them. By the time of the exile, they were sacrificing their children to these false gods. Sometimes we read it and it's like, God, why are you so harsh? The, the cries of that innocent blood went up to him for hundreds of years. I think about our own nation, and I think of a quote by Thomas Jefferson, if I may paraphrase it, that the one thing that keeps, that keeps me up at night is that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. So God uses this prophet named Jeremiah to tell the people, this is God's judgment. You can't stop it. It's coming. You can just go with it and it'll be okay with you. They don't like it. They call him a prophet of doom. They, they don't like the things he has to say. In fact, they, they lower him into raw sewage. Now, there's some people I don't like, but I would never do that to anybody. They really didn't like him. But he was right. They resisted and they were completely crushed. It is now in the ruins of Jerusalem that Jeremiah pens this poem. Today, my sermon's called, Where Do We Begin the Rubble or Our Sins? For Jeremiah, his whole life, everything he wanted for the future, his whole frame of reference has now been crushed. And now the answer is, where, where are we going to begin here? This conquering nation crushes them, and the Lamentations, Lamentations is the righteous Jeremiah wailing at the outcome. It is, a, it is a poem of pain and suffering. Like I said before, it is a poem. In fact, to this day, the Jewish people, when they commemorate one of their tragedies during their holiday, they will go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. I believe Charlie and Jared are going there this year. Maybe you'll even see them do this. And they will read Lamentations. Like I said before, Lamentations is a poem. It's a series of five poems that is in this book. It corresponds to the five chapters. Chapters 1, 2, and 4 are 22 verses, and they are actually an acrostic, meaning that every verse is going to start with a different letter in the Hebrew alphabet. This helped them to, to memorize it well. Now, the third chapter, the chapter we're going to be reading, actually has 66. That is that every third line is now going to have the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Also making it easy to understand, easy to memorize, that is. Chapter 5, though, um, is, do, doesn't follow that way, even though it is still a poem. I guess the author felt, I helped you, I helped you enough here. <laughs> Figure out number 5 on your own. Um, it's very important to the Jewish people. This is a poem of sorrow, heartache, and pain. A lot of times in our Christian walk, we wonder, how can something like that be useful to us? So there I was. I was reading chapter 3 of Lamentations. I randomly picked it. And I get to verse 1. I am the man who has seen the affliction of the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. I freeze when I read this because I'm like, what is this guy saying? This is God's word. But he's blaming God for his troubles. In fact, he's not even blaming God. He's saying that God is doing this to him. He's saying that God broke his bones. He's saying that God made him eat gravel till his teeth broke. And I'm reading this, and I'm a young Christian. I thought, like, okay, I came to Christ. I thought everything was supposed to be okay. 
We didn't talk about our problems anymore. We didn't talk about the darkness anymore because we just, say, we just thought everything was, was made well and good. So I'm reading Lamentations chapter 3, and this dirty little secret in my soul is being brought forward to where I'm reading, and I'm like, I feel like that sometimes. Sometimes I feel like God's made me the target for his arrows, that I am the man who has seen the affliction of the rod of his wrath. This book messed with my theology in such a profound way, but it made it right. Now, I had, now, being in Christ, I had even more problems than before. I had so many resentments that were going to take years and years to heal. Hurts and emotional wounds that would take decades to even know about. So I'm reading this chapter, and I'm like, I feel this way, but I thought you weren't supposed to talk about it. Like, you had all these problems and doubts and fears and pain, but you go to church and you put on a smile and you raise your hands and you go there and, and, God, is putting this, and but God is putting this in the Bible and saying that's not enough to go through the motions. Actually, Justine, great word from the Lord today that there's, that there's people today that they're in that dry place, going through the motions. I think that's one of the really sad things and it keeps, keeps coming up um, in, in our Christian walks is that we will have those times where we are dry. We will have those times where we're just, we're just not feeling it. Or maybe it's a time of really deep darkness, like things have really gone bad for us. But we come to church and we put on the smile, we raise our hands, but we might as well be mowing the lawn. It means about as much to us. And I think what's hard is we feel so ashamed that we don't want to tell anybody. You know what's bad about that is you are now robbing your brothers and sisters in the Lord from being the church to you. Galatians says, Bear, with each, bear one another's burdens, and this way you'll fulfill the whole law of, of Christ. That, that's powerful. That's what we're talking about today. Lamentations teaches us how to overcome darkness. In The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, the book, not the movie. I don't just watch movies, I read books. Believe it or not, Samwise, he is at Mount Doom with Frodo, and he looks up and he believes it's completely hopeless. He just wants to curl up and die. And we have this quote right here, and I'm quoting this verbatim. But even as hope died in Sam, or seemed to die, it was turned to a new strength. Sam's plain hobbit face grew stern, almost grim, as he hardened, as Will hardened in him. And he felt through all of his limbs a thrill, as if he, had, as if he was turning into some creature of stone and steel that neither despair, nor weariness, nor endless barren miles could subdue. Lamentations is going to take us on a journey where, a journey to become someone that neither despair, nor weariness, nor endless barren miles can subdue. Let's read our scripture for today. You can follow up here, or you can go to your Bible app and go to the live event. If you have a smartphone and you don't have the Bible app, do you even smartphone, bro? Chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. I remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Now, you're go we're going to be staying here. We're going to be going through this verse by verse. So Pam, if you want to go to the very start of those slides, verse 19. My first point here is going to be on verse 19 and 20, and it's titled, When It's Your Turn. So far, this book is really dark. The author is reminiscing about the dark, about the despair, about the depression and hopelessness of not only of himself, but also his wider community. They have been crushed. He warned them, and they didn't listen. So the invaders smashed them to pieces. And who's caught in the middle but righteous Jeremiah? Jeremiah, who did everything that was right, but he still feels the brunt of life. Tonight, today I mean, this morning, whether, whether your troubles are caused by your own sin or the sins of somebody else, I want to talk about hope today. I want to talk about how God molds us in the midst of the darkness and that he doesn't waste a hurt. Jeremiah expresses this hurt and pain using metaphors of God just beating the tar out of him. And here's the thing, we all have these seasons in our life. We all have these seasons, we don't like them, but when it's our turn. It's easy for us to praise God when the sun is shining, when our family's healthy and the bills are being paid. It's a whole nother thing 
when the snow just won't stop, when the rain just won't stop. A couple weeks ago or a month ago, it feels like yesterday and forever ago, I had flooding in my house. That was not fun. That was not an every day is a Friday moment. I had to stay up literally all night long, suctioning it with my little shop vac. And I'm like, is the rain ever going to end? It's hard when the rain won't end. It's hard when we can't make our bills and our property get forced closed on. It's hard when we see our loved one slowly die. It's hard to praise God. And tonight, I mean, this morning, my, my message to you isn't look on the bright side of your life or to give you some platitude like, you know, every cloud has a silver lining or a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. These platitudes mean basically nothing when you've been up since 3 a.m. and you're so worried about your children, about your job, about your spouse. This message is about the purpose and salvation that's found amidst suffering. That in the midst of our deepest despair, God is there for healing and a purpose that we could never imagine or understand this side of eternity. And the sweetest times I've ever had in worship was when my heart wasn't in it. When I couldn't think of anything in myself to praise God for, but I did it anyway. So many of the Psalms, that's what they are. I mean, so many of you, you probably felt this way and you felt very ashamed about it. But there's so many psalms where, where the psalmist is having war amongst himself and he's saying, why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your trust in God. It's like he's saying to his very being, why aren't you buying into this? This is the truth of God. And the sweetest times I've ever had in worship was when I was there. My father died my freshman year of college. My story is that my mother and father divorced very early when I was a kid. I barely knew my dad. And when I turned 18, when I graduated high school, I was thinking, no, this will be the time for me to establish any kind of relationship. And what happens? He gets cancer and he dies. Like so many people, I didn't want to deal with it right away, so I just ran away, got busy with a lot of stuff. And it was a year later to where I actually came to grips, and it was a very dark night to start off with. And I had so many ugly feelings even towards God that I didn't know how to express. And I, I didn't want to accuse God of wrongdoing. I, see, I saw how bad that turned out for Job, but I had to say, God, this isn't fair. It was finally going to be time for me to have a relationship with my dad, and then he dies. And I had all these, these feelings in this moment of, of, of such sorrow and I decided even though I didn't feel like it even though I was hurt and I was in pain and I was suffering I was like I'm still going to praise him because though he kills me yet will I praise him and that is something that doesn't even come from the heart so to speak it comes from the head and then the, our spirit falls in line Alistair Begg from Truth for Life said that Lamentations teaches us to cry See, I, I thought that was a really insightful way to see this, chat, this, uh, this book here, is that it teaches us to cry. But at first I was thinking, like, you know, why do we need to learn to cry? We all know how to do that. Now, as a side note, I would like to cry the way that people in movies cry, because, like, you know, they just look in the middle distance, single tear. <laughs> and they look so cool. You know, when I cry, and I don't cry much because I'm a man, I'm just saying it. Um, when I cry, I don't know where my tears end and my snot begins. <laughs> I do the ugly crying, but you know something I got to say? I think there's only one type of crying, that's the ugly crying. And then there's like the manipulative crying, you know? So anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. Alistair Begg says this teaches us how to cry. And I think he's right. Because the Bible does give us, it does give us, examples, directives on how to mourn, grieve, express frustration. Often it's not what we think. It's not denying the reality of the situation and cover it up with sayings that sound good, but carry the hurt with us forever. The author is saying that, that what the author is doing is dwelling on his pain, on the desolation of God's people in his own personal pain. We can get something out of that. Because if he does that, maybe we should do that. That is not where it ends. But staying in this point of darkness, and believe me, this will get better. I know this, this sermon so far is a pretty big downer. But staying on that same theme here, Psalm 88 is so much more even heart-wrenching than Lamentations. 
to explain Psalm 88, I gotta, I gotta talk about this um, situation here at the church. Um, so on Fridays, uh, Jessica J- Jacobson, she cleans and she brings her daughter Mimi, which is really cool because Mimi always likes to see what I'm doing and all that. But Jessie tries to get her to watch a movie and she was watching that Trolls movie that I've never seen. And I, I'm typing away at my computer. Some of you guys are already laughing because you know, you know what that movie's like. That's a weird movie. Even if you've seen it, you gotta admit it's weird. I mean, like, like, like just as another side here, like another Jesse's Kids uh, tie, he's like singing True Colors by Cyndi Lauper one day. I'm like, how do you possibly know that song? See your true... So I'm, I'm in my office, I'm typing away, and I hear this like little voice singing, Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> Some of you guys know the song, like from Simon and Garfunkel, right? The song about ho- hopeless depression. And I'm like, I go out there, and I'm like, I go to Jesse, I was like, why did that little troll girl sing uh, Sound of Silence? And uh, she's like, oh, she was putting her friend to sleep. I was like, interesting choice. (laughs) I say that all to lighten the blow here because Psalm 88 ends this way. Darkness is my only friend. Darkness is my only friend. Um... Only, so the problem with the, the author of Psalm 88 here, you know, it stops me in my tracks when I read that because it's such hopelessness. And I know so many of us have felt that way. And that those, those dark nights where we don't feel like there's hope, that darkness is our only friend, but we're wrong. The author of that psalm was wrong, but God put it in his word. He put it in his word for a reason. Just to talk about what he was wrong about that is he was confusing his subjective feelings with objective truth. It's a big problem in our society right now. People think that their feelings is literally the truth. That you can reshape reality around your feelings. This is very harmful towards us. But God puts it in his word because God knows what, it lo- what it's like. He knows what it's like to set what we sound like when we're desperate. When we're at our wit's end. And there is a, there's a healing. There is a strengthening in this. Because there's only one person whose darkness truly was his only friend. Only one person who is in right relationship with God who was abandoned by God. I'm talking about the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. On the cross, he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The utter loneliness on the cross as he endured the very wrath of God, the full wrath of God for me and you. I'm going to read verbatim what somebody else had written because I thought it was so good. Tim Keller says this of this chapter. Um, when Jesus went to the cross, his followers abandoned his followers and friends abandoned him, um, him, and he felt the full wrath of God. This is the quote from Tim Keller: "Jesus Christ experienced darkness as his only friend, so that in your darkness you can know that Jesus is your friend." Michael Wilcock, in his his commentary on Psalm, says this: "This darkness can happen to a believer." The Psalm says. It doesn't mean you're lost. This darkness can happen to someone who does not deserve it. After all, it happened to Jesus. This doesn't mean you've strayed. This darkness can happen at any time, as long as this world lasts, because only in the next world will such things be done away with. This darkness can happen without you knowing why, but there are answers, there is a purpose, and eventually you will know it. God will do amazing things if you'll let him in healing you, in strengthening you, even during those dark times. My second point today comes from verses 21 and 22. It's hope. Finally, hope. I know the first part was a downer, but we're going to get to where, where God wants us to lead us out of the darkness into the light. Finally, hope. There's a lot we can learn from and develop in those dark times. Um, but my message to you for today is not, my message for you today is not that life is hard and dark times come, but look on the bright side, eventually you'll die. That's not what this passage is about. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you in depression today. Instead, this leads to hope, finally hope. If the weeping prophet in the midst of the hellish landscape of a post-exiled Israel can find hope, dare I say it, even joy and peace. Isn't it important for us to know how and why? It's not a platitude. It's not every cloud has a silver lining. And it's not, and this is one I see a lot, God will give you more, God will never give you more than you can handle. That sounds really nice, unless you read the Bible. 
The person who wrote it, I mean, I, I, it does sound encouraging. God will never give you more than you can handle. If you read the Bible, God's constantly giving people more than they can handle. I mean, Moses tells him to his face, I can't handle this. And God's like, but you will anyway, because I'm going to help you. <laughs> Pastor Terry just preached a message where, where Jesus said, this is impossible with man, but nothing is impossible with God. He doesn't expect us to do it. Which is awesome, because we couldn't. So that saying that God will never give you any more than you can handle, oh, sure he will. So you better be relying on him. That's the, that is hope that we have here. Verses um, 21 and 22. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. Can I talk about, can I talk about being consumed today? When I talked about subjective feelings versus objective truth, sometimes we can feel that we are consumed. Um, only, only, um, the only season of American Idol I've ever watched or ever voted in was uh, the season with Danny Gokey. I don't know if you guys know who that is or not. I don't know who he is because he's the only person I ever voted for. By the way, it was just one season, so stop judging me. I was young. I was married. Becca made me do it. I got all the excuses. I like Danny Gokey. He's the only person I ever voted for because I liked his story. I liked how he sang, too. He was a worship leader. His young wife, they had they'd gotten married. And um, four weeks before he auditioned for American Idol, she dies of a heart complication. He has a song called... What is it again? Sounds like Amy knows it. Go ahead. Hope in front of me. Hope in front of me. So I wanted to say all that to say that this line from there, he knows what he's talking about. He says, I might be down, but I'm not dead. There's better days still up ahead. You might be, can feel consumed about your current trial or circumstance. You might feel like you're down, but you're not dead. God is still in control. He still has a part for you. When people go through really traumatic things, things that are in their control or outside their control, maybe divorce, the death of a family member, Maybe they themselves seriously mess up and they're like, God can't do anything with this mess. How can he turn this message, mess into a message, this trial into a testimony? We feel consumed that there is no hope left, but there is hope left. That is what the author is saying, that he called this to mind and therefore he has hope. There are two words in this passage. In verse 22, because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, his compassions never fail. There's these two words in there that gave me a whole new perspective on this. I studied them in the Hebrew, the original language. That's something I'm not really comfortable in. I'm much more comfortable in studying the Koine Greek of the New Testament because it's much more of a specific language. Hebrew is much more of a poetic language. So I had to do like a lot of research this week, so you know, you're welcome because, <laughs> man, it was difficult. I, I'm just kidding. I was, I was so incredibly blessed by this, and I hope you are. These two words, love and compassion. For the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. Verse 22 has a lot in it. It's the reason we're not consumed, and it's the rock we stand on during the storm. But there are two words that I want to point out here. That first word is the word for love. Get all my notes together here. Love. The word for love in the Hebrew here, in this specific location, is chesed. Chesed. This, is, this word comes from a root that means ardent desire. That means the love that we're supposed to be focusing on, meditating on, is the zeal-like love that God has for us. That no matter how great our trial is, no matter how great the emotions we're dealing with, his love is stronger. His love is more powerful than hate. His love is more powerful than the sorrow. His love is more powerful than the desolation, than the rubble. His love, his hasad, his ardent desire, the love of God is powerful beyond comprehension. And it was, it was when, the under, when the author understood this in his mind, that God's great love, that his soul began to find peace, healing, and comfort. A lot of times when we are feeling this way, we don't go to God. We don't meditate on his word. We'll complain around the people around us. 
that doesn't do us any good. That doesn't do us any good. You ever think about like Job, for instance? At the very end, when, 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 when Job confronts God, and he asks him why, and then God confronts him, he says, where were you when I made all these things? At the very end of Job, God tells Job's friends that Job had honored him in what he said, and they didn't. And I wonder why that is. I read this commentary, and the person said the reason why that was is because Job was talking to God, not to his friends about it, about his issues with God. That makes a huge difference. We're commiserating with friends or people, and we're like, why is God doing this to me? It doesn't really lead to anything good. But when we come to God in honest brokenness, that is when healing begins. That is when we find, when we find a salvation for that circumstance. That second word I want to talk about right now is rakam, rakam. This is a plural noun in the Hebrew. After I studied this one, I had to stop what I was doing, and I, I, I had to worship God because of how amazing this is. Rakam, compassion, it is the feeling that a parent has for their newborn child. Me and my wife don't have children, as many of you know. But in my spirit, I feel this. That God's love for you, those of you who have kids, remind yourself right now in your mind what it was like to hold them for the first time. When you're in the darkness, when you're in the pain, when you're in the suffering, God is holding you like you're holding your son or daughter. And it's a plural noun for a reason. It's not that God has several different kinds of compassions. It's that the compassion he has towards us, the love he has towards like a parent for their child, is more powerful than just saying it. It means they don't have a good word for it. So what, what, how does he have hope? How does he come out from under this? He dwells he dwells on the love and compassion of God. There's this word that's used in the Bible, meditate. And when we think of meditating, we probably think of transcendental meditation, where you're em- emptying your mind. In the Bible, it's the exact opposite. It's where we fill our mind, where we focus. I meditated on Racham this week, and I was so overcome by the love of God. When that moment when I was mourning a loss of relationship with my dad, I felt the rakam of, of Christ. In moments where I lost my, my grandpa to cancer, and everybody might, I mean, there's so many people in my family I've lost to cancer, and I think of God's rakam. And it's, and it's not a platitude. It's not just something that's like, oh, this seems, seems really nice. It rips me out of the darkness into his glorious light. My final point today the sun always rises in the morning. The sun always rises in the morning. If you have your Bible out, you'll, take a, you'll notice that I did a little play on words here. It's said S-U-N, I have S-O-N. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. This starts the upswing of the rest of the chapter. What was happening to the people of Israel specifically was because of their sins. But it wasn't too late. Remember the terrible litany of sins I talked about? It wasn't too late. God still had a promise. He was going to fulfill, even if they didn't fulfill their part of it. God was still promising a savior, and that a descendant of David would still be on the throne forever. The sun was still going to rise. I'm going to talk really briefly here about systematic theology, and I don't want anybody falling asleep. It's kind of a big word. It's a theological word. It's advanced Bible study thing. Um, it is, theology means the study of God. Systematic, as you imagine, is a system of parts working together for a whole. Your engine in your car is a system. It has all these parts, and if they don't work together well, your engine won't work. And if you're me, unless that thing is say E, you have to take it to the shop. And they got to go through all the stuff and figure out why it's not working. So when we talk about systematic theology, we are going to take parts of things that we're going to learn from different passages, and we're going to put them together to make a coherent thought that is going to hopefully apply to every verse. If it doesn't, then we've messed up. One of the parts aren't working. So for instance, this is just an example. When we talk about sin, the theology of sin, here are three three truths about sin. One, sin is the opposite of who God is. God is light, sin is darkness. Two, sin leads to death. 
three, in order for God to defeat sin, he has to defeat death. So how does this work together in the story of the scripture? Well, we're all sinners. Sin is the opposite of God. It makes us separate from God. It means the wrath of God abides on us. Because sin leads to death, that means that we deserve judgment. But because God wants to do away with sin because of his great love for us, he sends Jesus Christ, who dies but comes back to life. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead, and that means we too will rise one day. He has defeated sin, hell, and the grave. Amen, indeed. That is good news. So I say all that, and I hope everybody still awake, because I'm going to show you something in Scripture when it comes to Jesus in the morning that is going to blow your mind and give you hope, give you joy throughout the ages. Let's talk about Jesus in the morning. Genesis 1-5, this is the first morning. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The very first day of creation is before the S-U-N, is before the sun, before the suns and the stars for the sun and the stars. Yet there was still light. Where did that light come from? It came from God. It came from the sun. S-O-N. I better get these things right or you guys will get a little confused. S-O-N. We know that God, Jesus Christ was there in the beginning because of John chapter 1. Let's do our next step here. Mark 16, 2. A better morning than the first morning. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. What we're talking about here is Jesus Christ died and darkness swallowed the earth, both metaphorically and physically. Three days later, it is morning, and the women are going to the tomb to go check on Jesus. But he's not there, is he? The sun has risen in the morning. Finally, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23 and 24. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of earth will bring their splendor into it. In Revelation, the stars and the sun have been melted. All that's left is a new earth and a new Jerusalem, the city of God, where he walks with his people. And they don't need the light of the sun, and they don't need the light of a lamp. Because he is their light. So when you read, when you read verse 23, they are new every morning. They are new every morning. The resurrected son, the hope of the gospel, the hope of every promise in scripture is new every morning. No matter how dark the night, there's a morning, right? Amen. So next time you have a sleepless night, next time, even if it's during the middle of the day, and you get into the dark, you get in the dark spot where the enemy is lying to you, where our enemies are lying to us, the only way I know to combat darkness is with light. The only way I know to get warm when it's cold is to get warm, to, to put on a blanket or whatever. So the only way I know to combat lies is with the truth. And in those dark moments, I would quote to myself, it was the first scripture I ever memorized in my life, and I know it today. Lamentation 3, 19 through 24. I remember my afflictions and my wanderings, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. For the Lord's great hasad, we are not consumed. For his come never fails. They are new every morning. Please pray with me.